So do we want to talk for a second about the, any exercises uh, from last week or the lab? Well, I had a question. I had a question about two of them. Uh, okay. Maybe somebody could add some insight to one of them was exercise five. <clears throat> uh, did anyone else do exercise five? About the who can, who can remember it? Actually, I guess would be the next question. But um, the issue I had there was that at the end, um, it had, I don't know if you remember this one. It's like okay, let's do that student default thing again. And yeah. has you do regression on the uh, logistic regression with the um, default, depending on the income and balance, and using a training set and a you know half training, half sample, random, right, or half training, half test, uh, random division between the two, and then it says, okay, well, you know, what's that do? And then it says, okay, now add in the student, what does that do? And I found it didn't make much of a difference at all. I don't know if that's what you guys got, and what what are we supposed to? Con- it says like, what do you, what what does it say? It says, what do you conclude from that? I'm like, I don't know what I conclude from that. Anyone else have any idea what I'm talking about? I did the uh, the lab stuff and the conceptual. I don't think I okay. got that question, um, but I'm just reading through it right now. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Ron. I did not even get a chance to go through labs. Um, I just read the chapter for this week and figured I. Get on this is last, this, this is chapter five actually we're talking about yeah yeah i, I know exactly is that um oh uh, i see what you mean. Is visiting so i'm technically off for vacations but i did want to keep up with the book club mm-hmm. but i'm not super successfully I, I know it's summer so I, I was just commenting on that saying that boy it's summer and everybody's having a heck of a time uh yeah uh, me exactly. myself included like i've been traveling like, <laughs> three, four times, so. So, so ron you found that that um adding in the student dummy variable didn't lead to a reduction in the test error rate? Exactly. Mm. So I don't know, I really, I, I, I just hoping that somebody else did it so they could say, oh yeah, no, mm-hmm. that's what you should have got or no, I did, I guess I'm different, that type uh, of thing. Yeah. It might make sense because if you remember from chapter four, uh, when you did this, they did this in the book, the adding the student actually had a negative regression they commented on that that it was actually normally if you just did it versus student it turns out students defaulted more but if you did it if you added the other things it turns out being a student reduced your probability of default but it was really low um significance uh, low p uh, high p value or whatever right so maybe that's why I, I don't know that that's what that's makes sense that's just an explanation is not i haven't really delved in a test on that as my I, thesis advisor used to say that's just invoking voodoo but um <laughs> but that's my voodoo for why that happens <laughs> um is this in terms of student how like balanced is the the data set um oh i don't know actually so yeah. so i'm just wondering it's, like, it's uh actually i do know um depending on what like uh 70 percent not students 30 percent students turns out so it's not terribly imbalanced but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. i mean even it, like i'm just wondering like if it, it might differ based on the type of error statistic you're using you know um especially if it's the overall error rate you just overall yeah and um maybe it's better differentiating like the minority case or something um i don't know Um, yeah think about it but the only other comment um, that I had, and maybe now it's just a comment since you guys haven't done the exercises mm. yourself, but it's kind of interesting. If you look at exercise nine, um, I found that the bootstrap errors on like the median and the 10th percentile were actually fairly close to the standard error of the sample mean. I don't know if that was, a, it's a general feature of, you know, especially the median, it's actually, there's no really good close form formula for the standard error on the medium, but you can do a bootstrap and it turned out to be really close to the standard error on the mean. Which I thought was interesting. So huh. if, anyone, if anyone goes back and does that, something to think about. If you see something different, you know, uh, message me. <laughs> yeah. And it's not for generic, it's not a general case. It's only for this Boston data set that they have you do it for. So I haven't tried to test it in more like general simulated case. Mm-hmm. I guess it's not, it's not that terribly interesting for me to go through and do it, but I just, I just wanted to point that out. It's kind of interesting that that worked out can, that way. Ron, can, can you repeat that, please? I'm trying to think about it. Um, 
Well, because so that, on the Boston data set, they had you yeah. do a bunch of bootstraps. That's a, you know part of the one of the topics of this chapter five. Okay. And what they say, okay, give a bootstrap estimate of uh, the standard error of the median, which you know, so you take mm -hmm. bootstrap samples and calculate the median over and over and over mm -hmm. again, and then you get mm -hmm. the, some kind of a standard deviation for that, which you can turn to a standard error. And it turned out mm -hmm. it was pretty close to the standard error on the sample mean, you know, oh, sigma was squared yeah. n type thing. Yeah. But that was kind of interesting. Were you expecting it not to be? Like, should it be bigger? I actually have no idea what it should be. I mean, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be a real closed form. I guess it would really depend on the underlying distribution a lot. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like if it's highly skewed, maybe. Yeah. That, you know. Anyway, just something. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Right. It says comment on your findings like well that, i don't know i mean that's <laughs> it's interesting that's my comment <laughs> so I was, I was hoping you know if you guys go through that and get any different observations i'd be interested to know okay number nine okay yeah and thanks ron for your uh your that that link with the um for for number two um yeah and your discussion i Totally, totally missed where the parentheses was on it. Um, um, but well, uh, I recognize the form orders? of that. Yeah, orders. Orders. yeah I, because yeah. in physics that comes up a lot. So I recognize that right away. Oh, that's just, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. I actually, I ran the, like the simulation and, and I was like, wow, that is uh, quite a strong like ceiling there. <laughs> you yeah. know, it just, just like reaches that limit and like kind yeah, of stays. 63% six, or whatever, yeah. One over E, one yeah, over E. One over e. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. like sixty-three percent, I want to say, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we can go on to chapter six then. Yeah, sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. Let me find my the window with this in it. <laughs> because so many windows going here. Oh, what did I change here? Discard that. Okay. So this chapter was um, pretty interesting, I thought. Did you guys get a chance to read the chapter? The only thing I've done is read. I haven't done any lab work or anything like that for this one. Yeah, I yeah, actually read, read the whole thing. And I liked it a lot. I, I don't know why. I found it very engaging. Yeah, I, I read everything up until dimension reduction. Um, so the shrinkage stuff I got through. Right, okay. Uh, okay, all right, that's fine. I'm not sure if we'll get... Yeah, I mean, I felt here. it was a lot. Uh, it was a lot, yeah. Then, so. I'm looking for the right window to share. Is that this one? Yeah, okay. Now you can see my notes. Is it big enough? Yep. Yeah, it looks good to me. So I just took the notes that were there. I edited them some uh, quite a bit in the first part and not so much in the last part because like you, I didn't really spend as much time on the uh, dimensional reduction part 6.3 and 6.4. But um, the basic idea of this chapter is model selection, right? We learned last chapter about how to evaluate with using cross-validation. This chapter is like, okay, what do you do with that sort of, I think, right? Uh, take the, um, so, you know, how to find about, and only dealing with linear models in this chapter, which there's already a lot, a lot of interesting things you can do with linear models is what they're trying to show you. Um, so what they, they're calling a regularization here. Sometimes it's called, um, uh, shrinkage, I guess he's both, I guess re maybe regularization is the whole topic and then shrinkage is one method of it. And I always think of this, reg uh, adding these doing like ridge and lasso is kind of regularization as well. Um, or that's what you mean by regularization and subsets different, but I don't know. I'm not sure what the terminology, do you guys know what the, is there a well-known terminology there? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what the new, like uh, if one's a subset of the other or, um, yeah. yeah, I'm not quite sure, but I think I, I heard them use interchangeably. Okay. But, so the goals of this chapter is to learn about subset selection, learn about the shrinkage methods, learn about uh, how to reduce the dimensionality 
using PCR and PLS, which is kind of funny because it doesn't really reduce the dimensionality, but it sort of constrains it. And then mm. it just and think about uh, higher dimensional, what the, some of the challenges are that you run into when you deal with higher dimensional data, or rather I should say higher dimensional, more large number of parameters, right? Um, so, mm -hmm. so the context again is that we're doing linear models um, and the question is why would you want to constrain or remove predictors and the, one of the most important reasons here is to reduce the variance you know the bias is low we're already assuming that the linear model works well but you still may have a lot of uh, variance because you have a large number of parameters compared to the number of data points you have right clearly if you have exactly the same number of parameters and data points the the variance becomes huge because every time you fit you're going to get a completely you know you only get one line but you're always going to get a different line every time you fit right and then if you have more parameters than than data <laughs> that's a really bad situation right you can't actually make a fit it's overdetermined, right so uh so the issue here again is high variance how do you deal with it you do it by somehow reducing the flexibility of the model somehow right by constraining and removing predictors that's was my take on this anyway the other advantage, though, that they do point out for removing or constraining uh, the variables is a simple, especially when you, if you can remove the variables, right, either by subset selection or by, as we'll see, by lasso um, regularization, then, yeah, that's helpful for simplifying the model, making it easier to interpret. So first, this first part of the book, first part of this chapter was about, oh, I just want to add one more thing about the variance bias thing, because when I read this chapter, once again, I ran my head into the variance, uh, variance bias trade off and like, I really understand this bias variance. And so actually, again, Wikipedia to the rescue there, um, there's a good, if you look up bias variance trade off in Wikipedia, there's actually a really good explanation. Hold on, I just move this out of there. Um, and I just want to point it out. Uh, I'm going to add it to the thing here in a minute here. Where now can I find this thing? Actually print, I actually saved it. Yeah, here it is. Where's the thing? Actually, I'll just put it in the Slack and somebody will say, what the hell is that for? Uh, that is a great, I don't know if I put, shared this before, but this is a great, explanation really helped me understand what bias and variance really are so it turns out one way to think about it is bias is if you had a, a a model for simulating the data right and then you were to fit that over and over again or maybe with a bootstrap too but if you had a model to simulate the data you you take a sample of it and fit it over and over again the average fit you have would be the bias or the difference between the average fit and the real truth the true model would be the bias and then how much that uh, that fit jumps around every time you sample get a new sample that's the variance so it's really the mean and variance of something and that something is the the fit over average over or i should say uh, statistics taken over new samples from the data or new samples from the model i should say anyway the wikipedia page clearly is going to do a better job than i just did explaining it but i don't know if that helps you because that before i just found it hard to wrap my brain around what the heck the bias variance thing was what was going on but thinking about it in the simulated world really helps me uh, helped me a lot so maybe it'll help you or maybe it's all crystal clear to you already i don't know i do not know where is the thing thanks ron yeah i'll i'll read it um, cool yeah i mean i think it makes to me it, it makes sense one second <clears throat> Um, to me, it makes sense when you think about it, we, like we were saying, to the extreme, where yeah. you, have, you go from like, you know, one variable and many data points to like many, many variables or many parameters that you're trying to fit. Um, and in that case, right, like you're kind of like tuning, like almost like one to one parameter to like change in the data and like you're. I don't know. I guess, I, I guess in some ways it's kind of like more sensitive to. Exactly. Yeah. No, it is. It's exactly noise, what I think of right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. More sensitive to the, no, the irreducible noise stuff. Yeah. Okay. So the 
The next part is the first algorithm for reducing, I guess, is some sense, I would say the most straightforward thing, just like take a subset of the variables, try all possible subsets that exist, <laughs> right, including none, and figure out which ones the, has the less, uh, where it works the best, right? Um, the, the details of that are, are in the algorithm here, but that's basically the gist of it, right? Just start with the, the, the null model with no parameters and fit, you know, fit that, which means just, you know, take the mean. Then, uh, then try with every possibility with one parameter, then every possibility with two parameters, and figure out which one is best using some measure. For example, here they measure, they mentioned all these things like this CP, BIC, AIC, um, adjusted R square. Those are all introduced in the book chapter. I find these things to be like magic recipes though, because I don't know where they came from and I haven't had a time to go back and, and, and learn where these magic formulas come from. They all just correct the, uh, the error, the, the error from the testing, the training data with some kind of penalty for having so many parameters, right? Uh, but clearly to me, at least the best is gotta be this cross validation we just learned about, cause that seems straightforward. It's not so magic and you know, that's what I would probably go to, but maybe these other ones are faster, right? You don't have to do so much calculation and might be good for the initial wash through, uh, to figure out which one's the best, especially as you're doing, you know, so many two to the P two to the P possibilities, right? That's how many you have to do with this best subset selection. Uh, and again, you know, they give an example and there's like 20 parameters. You're going to have to do, you know, over a million different fits. Um, so you probably want a really fast way to, well, you don't, I guess you don't have to do, um, the cross validation on all two to the P you only have to do that for P of them. You just, cause for each, for each, uh, level for like, you know, if you have five parameters, if you're at the, looking at the best fit with which subset of five parameters, you can use just the, uh, you know, the, the R squared or something without adjusting it because the, the adjustment doesn't make any difference. Right. I mean, it's like, it's a constant for that case. So I guess even then you can use cross validation. So I don't know why, I don't know what the value of these other methods are and I haven't really learned about them. Do you got any of you guys with more experience with that? Have some knowledge or some intuition about these other CP, BIC and all that? Yeah. Um, I think I've just seen those used. Um, I don't know. I, I, well, sorry. Let me just back up for a second. Let's say something before we go into the question. You yeah, asked yeah. about BIC. I was, I was really surprised that it's basically just like, the cp formula but just like with another term or a slightly different term and i assumed it was going to be very different because it references like bayesian information criterion right and um anyway that just surprised me that it was that it was like very similar to right with a the, log yeah yeah you know, with but, a lot yeah exactly yeah. Um, um but yeah, I don't know. I, I but what you were I, saying, so I'm kind of confused with what you're saying a second ago. Like if you were using subset selection and you wanted to choose the best model, you would have to do even more fitting with with uh with cross validation, right? Because like you'd still need to test the same permutations of combination of predictors, but the way you would evaluate it would be kind of like train test like folds. Right. Um, Can you, um, so no, what, so you're right. You do need to cross validation, but you don't need to use it necessarily for finding when you, let's say you, you, you know, you, it does K equals one, K equals two, right? You try each one of these yeah. numbers of parameters. Let's say you're looking at four, you know, okay. What's the best set of four parameters uh, And that when I'm when evaluating that little tiny space, well, not tiny, when I'm evaluating that space of just how, what's the best four parameters. Um, what the books it says you could just use the best lowest RSS that in that case because it's always going to be four parameters you don't you don't have to worry about getting you know uh, getting that false advantage of you for where five parameters is always going to be better than four parameters because RSS is always going to be lower right here I always have four parameters so just using RSS it seems reasonable and that's what they suggest too they don't suggest using cross validation to pick amongst those groups of sets of four parameters just use RSS now once you've got that best one with four you save that and then you do a cross validation on that to compare that to the best with five or the best with six, the best with seven. Does that make sense? Um, that's what they, that's what their algorithm was in the book. Uh, and it makes sense to me because there's no reason, for example, if I use uh, BIC or any of these, none of them yeah. are going to, that extra term is not going to affect it because P in that, or K in that, in this case, is going to be the same for all of them. 
Which while is- I'm finding the best with k equals four, you know, so that's the third. You can you see my mouse? Does that actually show up on here? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So this is what I'm talking about right here. This part um, when you add a fixed k, then at the end you have a you have a best model for each possibility of k from m zero to m p. Those p models, those you can cross validate um, to find which one of yeah. those is actually the best. You have to use something different there because you use RSS, MP is gonna win every single time, right? Cause it's got the most, you know, yeah. uh, RSS is always gonna be lower for MP cause you've got more parameters overfitting, right? But so that's what you wanna use. You can't, you have no danger in other words of overfitting when you have exactly the same number of parameters and you're you know, yeah. running the best MK. I guess what I was saying is that like in that last step, when you have- Yeah, the last step you need to use- Model yeah. cross validation, Crawl's probably MSE is going to be like however many folds you have t- uh, as a factor, more times you have to fit. As yeah, but it's only going to be P, P not yeah, 2 to P. Yeah, it's going yeah, to be yeah. P, P, not 2 to P. But you're right. Yeah, it's going to be more fits. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found the whole section confusing. So I'm, I'm happy. That, I'm glad that we're discussing it um, to mm-hmm. help it get in my head, too. Anyway, the pros of this is it clearly will always pick the best subset um within the limitations of what we we're just talking about but you'll pick the best subset because it tries them all uh the the cons are well the, the first con is actually there is a danger of overfitting they say in the book because you are searching such a large space you might find a particular case that just happens to work really good with this particular sample of data you have right even with the cross validation so there's still some danger of like super overfitting which which i guess is something you can only detect by using the what we talked about last week where you actually have another holdout set that you're saved for later for, you know, for checking the prediction accuracy later, right? Ron, I have a kind of a dumb question. Why is it two to the P when you're testing all possible models? Why does the math work out to be two to the P? That's just how many uh, possibilities there are. I guess you just sum up this P choose K, uh, overall K, and that's what you get two to the P. I don't know. I, I can't do math in public, but <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. I, I was just wondering if you yeah. had like, yeah, why is it base two? Because you know, yeah. Like, okay. No worries. Yeah. I, Minor question. I, yeah, I, th- I feel like there's a simple explanation of just not coming to me right now. For that. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah. I'll probably be embarrassed when I think about what it was. Realize what it is later. <laughs> like, oh yeah, obviously. This big. Let's just put it that way. So anyway, overfitting is an issue. Uh, and because you're really, you know, you're really working hard on the data here, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're stretching the data out pretty good with this or fitting so many different models. And the other problem is it's going to be computationally expensive. Like it says, if your P is, you know, somewhat large, then it's going to become intractable at some point. You're never going to be able to fit it. I mean, exponential growth is the worst kind of complexity you can have in computation uh, theory, right? So <laughs> uh, that's that's really bad scaling and it's not going to work for bigger and bigger problems. I suspect if you're borrowing time on a supercomputer to solve your regression problem, you made a mistake somewhere early on in the model choice or something, right? <laughs> Probably. Anyway, so re- to resolve that, uh, there's, they talk about forward uh, stepwise subset selection, where, where now you're no longer considering as many possibilities. You just find, you first, again, you start with the null model, you find the best one with just adding one parameter, and then rather than trying all the best two parameters models, you now just ask for keeping the first one you already picked. That's the first steps wise selection. So that obviously requires a lot less models. They did the, they did the math, I didn't, but uh, with Pico's 20, instead of needing, needing a million different fits, you only need 211 uh, fits. So that's a huge reduction. And, and you can also go backwards on this, you know, this time starting, you can't do this in, in the case where, uh, P is greater than N, or but you can when N is greater than P. When you have more data than P, you can start backwards. Just keep have all the parameters, then take one out, see which one is best to take out, and just go on and so forth, right? And then they have the hybrid idea where you go back and we can combine both of these. You could add a parameter, add a second parameter, and then say, okay, now what if I take out one of the one of the other parameters and kind of go back and forth and do like a walk back and forth that way. They didn't go into a lot of detail on this, and I'm not exactly sure how it works in practice, practice but I can kind of see how it would work. Like if I just, if I'm at K equals four, and I'm like, all right, let's find the best fifth one to add, and I add, I find it, and I add it in. Now I go, okay, 
now let's see, could I take one of these out of the five that I have now? Do it that way. But I don't know how, like, do you keep going backwards or do you go, just want to go back once and then keep going forward? I don't know. So you need some kind of more fleshing out of how you want to approach that, right? I'm not having done this. Maybe the, the exercises will have something that'll clarify how that works. I don't know. Did, was that, did anyone else get a better feel for what this hybrid, how this hybrid back up? It was like a paragraph, right? A half a paragraph even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have much experience with that either. Okay, so then the next uh, section then is on the shrinkage. Wait, does this something have something interesting? Oh, this is just this is just a fleshing out of this business about choosing the best model. Um, these are these formulas for these other adjustments, which all make adjustments for the number of parameters you've added, penalties for the number of parameters. And this bottom bullet, I agree with the guy that wrote this. You know, you know, there's all kinds of issues with these adjustment math methods. One of them is a big one that sometimes you have no idea what the uh, or I see you have a really bad estimate of the uh, irreducible error. So you don't really know how much to scale that penalty by, especially when N is like the size of P, right? Then the irreducible error, is, you're, the sigma has going to be zero because it's going to fit through all the points. Um, and yeah, so that, and probably unreliable, I guess, if N is very close to, uh, or P is very close to N, even if it is less than N. So, oh, and the other thing, of course, these adjustment methods assume Gaussian errors and probably some other assumptions. I don't know, because I haven't gone through the derivation of these, but the cross-validation seems nice because it makes the fewer assumptions and uh, is easier to understand in some way, right? I just think cross-validation is cool. What can I tell you? I can understand why they, the, some of the websites use that as their name of their website. Cross-validation. <laughs> is that the, um, uh, is there like a question answer form called Cross yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah. Like Stack Overflow. Yeah, that's what it is. Stack Overflow. That's what it was. Yeah. But but there's one I think you're right. That's like uh, named like Stack Overflow, except for statistics that has that in the name. But yeah. One thing I remember, by the way, about the, from the chapter that, about the question of when you would use AIC, BIC, all these other ones versus cross validation RSS is um they were I think their point was like. They used to they used to be used more when computational resources were hard to come by. And now that we can you know do cross validation on like multiple cores and stuff, um, it becomes you know accessible to really anyone. So like they're basically I think just saying like you can use those to like save computation if those assumptions are met. Um, you know about the variance and things like yeah. that. Yeah, but. but but now, like, I think their perspective is like, why would you ever use it if you could just do cross validation in a efficient way? You know. Um, yeah, you're you're right. It's, I posted in the chat. Stats dot stack exchange. Uh, stack exchange is called cross validated when you go to cross validated. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, be a good username. I've been I've been cross validated, so you know I'm good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, uh, get rid of that. So next section goes into the shrinkage methods. These reduce variance by reducing the flexibility of the bottle model, and they can perform variable selection, in particular the lasso, right? Uh, the, it turns out that they give a substantial reduction in variance just for a slight increase in bias, meaning the fit is maybe not as... Uh, the bias, the error due to bias in the fit not matching the model as well is overcome by how much you've reduced the by the variance in terms of the test error right that's what we really care about is how well is the test error right um so it does that by penalizing the parameters and and it like it says here produces models that are somewhere between a null model and a ordinarily squares estimate and so this just reminds you what is the ordinarily squared estimate it's the minimization you're just minimizing this formula right Oops. Yeah, right. This formula. Um, and in the, in the shorthand, it's just, this is just the RSS, right? So the minimizing the RSS, changing the parameters to minimize the RSS, that gives you the least squared estimate. So when it, those, these, these shrinkage methods simply modify that by adding a term to the RSS that penalizes the 
coefficients for being big, right? And there's some parameter of the tuning parameter lambda, which controls how strong uh, that penalty is. So it can be zero, in which case it's basically just orderly squared, or it can be as big as you want. You make it big enough, eventually all the parameters are just going to go to zero. And the advantage of this is that the, well, you can see here in this figure that, you know, for an, on the far left is the ordinary least squared, mean squared error, the pink line, I guess. Is that pink or red? Red line? Why is that supposed to be purple according to the figure? I don't know, the top line is the test error. And you can see it, for a non-zero lambda, you actually get a better uh, test error, which is what you really wanted, right? So you've improved the model by reducing the variance. And here you could, the variance is the uh, green line, right? But the penalty, there was some penalty in terms of increased bias, but that's okay. The, uh, you know, you've more than made up for it enough that you actually lower test error. Does that make sense? It made sense to me. And, and on the right hand side, it's just the same thing, but now they do it in terms of the, uh, this two norm, um, which is just the norm in my view. But the reason why I call it two norm, because in the next section, they're going to talk about a one norm. So the sum of the squares is the coefficient square root, right? And compared to, you know, so what's happening there, this shows them being shrunk essentially, right? So they're being shrunk. Uh, you start out now left side of this, when the, when the coefficients are all zero, right? That's the far right on the other plot. And now you go all the way up to one, where you're now doing an ordinary least squared, right? And so that's, that's the other way of plotting it. I'm not sure exactly. The only reason I left that on here because it was easier just to cut and paste this whole figure rather than leaving out that second part because I didn't really see the big benefit in that. But looking at it that way, I like just looking at it in terms of lambda. But I guess it does show okay. you, like, yeah. Yeah, I had questions about them introducing that norms because I was like, I don't know exactly what it means other than, yes, it did seem like this flip side of the displaying the lambda parameter yeah. on the x-axis, which made a lot more sense to me because I'm like, I have no idea what these norms mean. Um, well, okay. so I'm it's glad just that you a, said that wrong. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just meant to say how big all the parameters are, right? That's all. As so, a, oh. Compared yeah. to the OLS estimate. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the magnitude of the vector. It's the magnitude of the vector. That the vector Got it. Okay. Okay. Where okay. it corresponds to all the parameters. If you make a vector out of the parameters and take the, the norm of it, that's what it is. Or the, uh, the length. The length. There you go. The length of that vector. Right? Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, that actually helps. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, by the way, one thing that they mentioned in the text and that they just pointed out here in this page is you do need to pre process these so that the betas are scale invariant um, by just, you know, turning them to z scores essentially, right? So, you need to, yeah, just normalize them by their standard deviation. Each of the the variables, not the parameters, but each of the uh, predictors, you want to you want to um, make them so that they have the same. They're on the same scale, right? Divide them by the standard deviation. I guess subtracting the mean is not important. I can't remember now, but no, I guess not. They don't bother subtracting the mean, but you could. Yeah. But you do need to stand, standardize the predictors. Is scale really important. it. Yeah. yeah, scale it. Yeah, because then yeah, then the lambda would have different impacts. Exactly, different. that's the issue, right? Right. I mean, they make, they make the example like, oh, what if I just change income to be in cents or something? They would increase it by a thousand percent, uh, you know, a factor of a thousand, and that would become much more important, it would get much more penalty than it would have otherwise. So in order to reduce that effect, that's what you do. Standardize. Standardize. Now the next method they introduce is the lasso, which is the same idea, but instead of the penalty being the square of the uh, parameter, it's the absolute value of the parameter. And this has the effect, although it's not obvious why, uh, at least initially, it's not actually maybe never, but it's not obvious why, it does shrink some coefficients directly to zero rather than just making them small. And that's shown in this figure here where they do, uh, this is for the credit data, um, and they're showing as the increased lambda or on the other side, the length of the, well, now they're doing a one norm length. So it's some of the absolute value, but it's still in some sense, another length of the vector of coefficients. Um, they show that as you increase lambda, parameters just start dropping out, which is a really nice feature. Like the income parameter drops out around lambda equals, what is that? 8,000 or something, right? And then 
more parameters drip drop out as other uh, as the lambda continues to increase. And it has a, it has the same kind of effect too, though, on the standard error, uh, the test error, and it does non-zero lambda helps reduce the the test error. So that's what you're really looking for, and it does it does help. And more importantly, it might also drop out some parameters. I guess whatever these light gray parameters in this first graph get dropped out, maybe actually this lambda looks like oh this is two different never mind these are so these are two different data sets. You can't look at these two plots together. I mean they don't have anything to do with each other. The, the second, the data sets with the mean squared error for some simulated data set, which is obviously when you think about it, how else are they going to calculate this perfect test error? Um, and they compare for the simulated data set the, uh, how the, the effectiveness of the lasso versus the ridge, and it turns out they're, you know, they're basically the same, you know, basically both work just as well, and at least on the simulated data set. The lasso, I think, is newer too. Like, um, it seems funny it would take so long for something to discover. Hey, why don't we just use the absolute value and see what that does? But I, I don't I guess you'd never really expect it to do anything so surprising yeah. as drop variables. I think weren't they saying, sorry, just to uh, go ahead, yeah. I probably uh, skipped. They the saying that, that they were explaining the similar performance of the two because in their simulation, none of the variables actually had zero relationship without <clears throat> so so right. like that's right. You had a data set where there was but where there's a really weak relationship with some of the variables, like like weaker than the one they showed, then Lasso would probably perform better. Yeah, um, they do. There's another fig, figure six point now which I didn't reproduce shows that. All right. Yeah. 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 Cool. I, I did. I kind of skipped over that, or among other things. Yeah, I do have one question about, but maybe we could wait until the end, like um, about like how <laughs> this kind of these kinds of shrinkage approaches impact interpretation um so like of the actual coefficients you know in the final model so like if you yeah. if you care so, about the magnitude of a you know of a relationship and you use different like shrinkage methods and you want to know like what the size of the effect was like you're using a lambda to improve your performance but what does that say about inference you know like on the on well, it's interesting. It's curve. interesting you thought of that because I also thought about that too, and I realized actually it doesn't matter in the end, right? What matters is you've now got a model. In the model, the lambda doesn't exist, right? The model is still the same model, or the same, you know, in terms of like y equals this plus, you know, some error, right? Mm -hmm. There's no lambda in the model. Lambda only comes in the regression, and the fact that the matter is that the test error is better with these choices of parameters than it was with the ones without the lambda. Um, mm -hmm. So the, this should be a better fit in that sense, right? You, you regularized okay. it to, and you've got a better fit. You got a better, you got a better prediction accuracy of these. So I think it should have the same uh, interpretation power. That these mm. are better estimates perhaps of the regression coefficients than without the Lambda, because what really right. should matter is the test error. Mm -hmm. And you just mm -hmm. couldn't get there. You know, you, you know, in principle, you could, you could just like do a really, really slow search where you just like, okay, I'm going to do, well, I, I worry about overfitting, but you know, I, where I keep doing uh, cross validation, and then then I you know change the parameters a little bit, do another cross validation, change the parameter a little bit, do some kind of super slow search, then you might be able to find the same place in the parameter space without yeah uh, without ridges or lassos. But uh, yeah, in fact, but you know we we look and we see oh this actually does better on the mm -hmm. in the tests at least with cross validations, or maybe if we had or even well actually also even in the case of the simulated data where they're not using cross validation, they're actually just generating new tests test sets from this, the underlying model and it does better mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's so, an interesting point yeah, yeah. so yeah, that, I, think what, what, I guess the insight i had is oh we need to think about the test <laughs> right? yeah. the test error is what matters yeah it's interesting because like i don't know i've been like reading a little bit this past year about causal inference and like those settings they talk a lot about like one of the one of the things that someone mentioned in this workshop i went to was like that the the error they're not like necessarily trying to like improve like they're not necessarily trying to like get the lowest error in a lot of cases they just care about like this one parameter and like the significance of this relationship um and i guess in that case you wouldn't want to use anything like this because you i don't know you have a very like i think a lot of those cases it's a very like theory driven kind of uh yes. subset parameters and 
like you just kind of include what you would include for your theory and then you see how it does and what shows up is you know significant relationship and um I mean, I, we're only but, halfway through this yeah. book but my view so far on this is that these tools are great for well statistical learning that's what it's about right but right, for right. inference i'm gonna go right back to my bayesian toolkit every single time yeah. <laughs> i'm yeah. not gonna use yeah. any of this stuff <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah no, it, um because the interpretability of the bayesian uh posterior distributions mm -hmm. is, is much more straightforward to me yeah I agree yeah yeah um the other thing i was thinking as you were going through this was um with going back to our discussions about multicollinearity, it seems like with like something like lasso ridge you'd still have like i was imagining those plots that you showed in uh i think maybe above on this page like you scroll up a little bit um uh you hear where variables start dropping out and where they start dropping out to, to like as a function of lambda and I would imagine that if you had multicollinearity, you would see, you know, sample to sample, like different, a different variable that, like, if two variables are highly correlated, I would bet it, and when one, one of them would drop out, like, like at one point, and maybe in another sample, the other, you know, variable that's <clears throat> highly correlated would drop out, um, you know, in that same, like, at that's that same sure. point. Yeah. So maybe they would have a similar kind of like, like point at which they drop out as a function of lambda, but it would wouldn't be consistent which one it is. You know, like sample yeah. to sample. Does that make sense? Like no, they I was mentioned just trying that, to think it, about how it's this true. And they happened. also did mention that in the context, and I imagine the same exact thing happens with lasso. Just what you're saying, but in the forward stepwise, for example, they mentioned that yeah, with different data sets, a different one might drop out. Uh, right. a different one might might be better to add than with a different data set. Uh, they mm -hmm. mentioned that in particular in the context of the genetic data, where there's a lot. Actually, maybe that's later in the chapter, but where there's a lot of a lot of parameters, a lot more parameters, and there's data, and you know which three are you going to use is almost completely random. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. yeah. I, but I think in those cases, it, with multicollinearity, it probably wouldn't improve your variance. <laughs> yeah. That no, much. You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Again, it's similar. I think. I, think uh, I don't know with like tree stuff, like like where the split happen if you have like like highly correlated variables it's just going to be random sample to sample you know um because they're both just as informative anyway yeah yeah okay it's just interesting trying to like spiral in the things that we were talking about last chapter to yeah. these new methods and yeah anyway i think there's a, just a lot of subtlety in these things when you really dig into it but that's okay I, this the purpose of this i think is to introduce a lot of these for me a lot of these things are new i you know, I, I, like I said, I come mostly from a Bayesian type background mm -hmm. or barring that, then an old fashioned, just crank the data, you know, through the regression, not think about it in the background. So these lasso and ridge regression and cross validations are kind of new to me. So that's, I'm really getting a lot of this section of the book more than anything yeah. else. Yeah, I, re I really was just following up on Kevin, the point that you brought about the multicollinearity, and this might be somewhat of a naive question, but in cases right that we're looking where we have so many predictors, how would you even eliminate some of those issues of collinearity? Like, would you do it before you do all of this ridge selection or lasso? Or are you expecting, like you were saying that, you know, sample to sample, you're going to get, okay, so maybe you do get consistent ones that drop out, right? And so maybe that's a sign where, okay, maybe you can just get rid of these. But if it's varying all the time, you know, which ones do you drop? And do you do it prior to all of this shrinkage? Do you do it after the shrinkage? I don't know. One thought is maybe it's mm -hmm. the dimension reduction before, before, um, that makes before. Sense, yeah. Yeah. Four red the lasso, you know, so you yeah, I was gonna you, say the dimensional reduction can address some of that for right, sure. Right, right, right. Okay. It has its own problems, but yeah. Okay, let me just wrap this part up because uh we're getting closer to the two o'clock hour. Uh this next section of the book was about how the lasso helps eliminate predictors. Why does it work? And for this, you had to kind of do a little Williams suspension of disbelief, at least for me, like why like it says it can be shown that the shrinkage methods are equivalent to just using ordinary least squared with a constraint that depends on the type of shrinkage. So this shows that just for two parameters that for the lasso, it's, you know, the absolute value of B1 plus B2 is less than or equal to S, where S somehow depends on lambda. And for the ridge, it's this circle constraint, like B squared plus beta one squared plus beta two squared is less than 
an S, right? Where S is, I guess it should be S squared, but um, I don't fix that. Actually, maybe it's not, I don't know what it is in the book. You know, it's not S squared, okay. Um, in any event, the this is shown graphically down below where the blue shapes on the left is the, the lasso. So it's this absolute value leads to a diamond shape, whereas the squared beta leads to a circle, obviously, right? Um, a radius square root of s, I guess. Um, and you, and then the, the red lines are contours of the RSS, right? So the best possible fit for unconstrained for the OLS is beta hat in both these diagrams. And as you move away from there, you get worse and worse, bigger and bigger RSS. Um, and then you try to find the smallest RSS that's inside the constraint. So the point is that when you have a circle, you hit when you hit the circle, you can you hit multiple points at once, and so you don't eliminate either beta one or beta two, even though you've constrained them quite a bit. Whereas with a diamond, it's got these well, it's got points on it, so the point will you know put beta one right down to zero, and beta two will now just be the only one left when that at that point, right? So that was the that was the point of this, like explaining its pointiness of the of this constraint that enables the lasso to eliminate predictors. I don't know how they derive that. It seems like it may be somewhat related because, you know, lambda kind of reminds you of, you know, uh, uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? So maybe it's something to do with that, or we're not optimizing on lambda over the RSS. So I don't know, but it may have something to do with that. I don't, I can't see how they derive this um, shrinkage meshes equivalent to these constraints, but I'll believe it. Yeah. I only have time to go into detail on so many things, but one, I mean, one question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I guess in my, in my view, the proof's in the pudding. When you actually do the lasso, you actually, you see things go to zero. So good, it works. So I don't need to necessarily spend my life on figuring out how it does work. But this gives a little bit more explanation uh, or maybe just pushes the explanation down further. Begs the question, so to speak, right? But yeah. Okay, so, I'm sorry, go uh, ahead. Is this the, sorry, this is a super question. But is this the, the representation? Is this the train RSS? That's yes. yes. That's being represented. Okay. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Access. Right. Yeah, I mean, I the thing I took away from this section that I liked, uh, just from an intuitive perspective, is the whole idea of like S as a budget. Um, yeah. And like you can only use your use up so much of your, you know, so you have so much budget and like you use it all in one variable, you have less for other variables and um like I feel like that was helpful um and i like kind of got the pointiness thing and you know like like it's you know it's like at that point you know one just totally drops out and you only have uh, yeah i don't know like it makes sense but i don't know uh i think the budget part was the most useful to me in that um yeah in this this section um like if you think of their like standardized coefficients then um you know each each one, you know, you can have different combinations of ways to add up to that budget, but at the end of the day, it's like zero sum. Um, yeah, uh, this, that's how I thought that was helpful. By the way, I was just looking through the exercises to see if they have one of these, you know, prove that by doing this type of things for that formula. Uh, I don't see, oh, there it is, exercise seven. It's got one of those going uphill hard things to do, but. So, oh, okay, cool. I'll have to do that one to figure out how that works. Cool. Oh, no, that's the Bayesian connection. No, I'm sorry. That's not what I was, that's, yeah. no. Which is also kind of cool though. Uh, yeah, I don't see them showing how that works. But anyway, uh, I do want to point out that exercise five does talk about correlated variables and ridge regression and lasso. So that's something to, to look forward to. That you were talking cool. about before. <clears throat> so this last section, I guess, I will have time for today, and we'll finish up six point three and six point four, and try to maybe do some of the lab next time, and then right. Uh, I, I think we can do that because I don't really have a lot to say about six point three and six point four. To tell you the truth, uh, they're they're more more uh, I don't know more hand wavy to me. Uh, but I just want to close with this Bayesian interpretation thing, which basically says that this these lasso and ridge can be thought of thought of as Doing a Bayesian uh, estimation with these different priors, so a exponential prior, a Gaussian prior corresponds to a ridge regression, whereas a double exponential corresponds to a lasso 
basso regression. And this is this connection is going to be hammered in in one of the exercises I just pointed out, exercise seven, um, why that works out that way. But uh, I thought that's pretty cool that there is a connection there. One of the things I think is interesting, though, is that I don't know if you would use, I don't know if you would pick, you know, change your prior to try to improve the the test accuracy. But then again, in Bayesian, I don't really think yeah. of it. I think like you, I think I'm doing Bayesian, I'm doing more um, inference and less uh, mm -hmm. predict, you know, trying to learn a good model, right, to make predictions. So maybe if I'm learning a good model, the, I would be adjusting my prior to improve my predictability, but it seems yeah. kind of wrong in some sense, your prior is your prior. What are you going to do? We'll keep changing it? No, but. Um, yeah. Aren't there, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't know as much about Bayesian approaches, but aren't there like different approaches where some people you like inform their prior by you know domain knowledge and kind of expertise and whatever and some people have more of a data-driven approach yes i mean there's like maybe three approaches there's like okay well there's that's two but uh yeah two approaches like you said mm -hmm. i'm mostly familiar with the you know basing on prior knowledge which could right. be nothing and then you just use a maximum entropy prior or something like that uh yeah. another factor there though often is you know making sure that your prior doesn't affect your results that much, you know, by tweaking your prior, see that your results don't change a lot because that that would be bad. Then that, it's a signal that you need more data if that happens, right? Well, well I need more data to, over, to overcome my prior. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But anyway, that's an interesting observation I thought they had about the, the Bayesian interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they, they tell you exactly how that comes up. That's left as an exercise, which I will do because it does sound interesting to me. Uh, yeah, any, do you have any intuition about the double exponential thing? Um, no, I mean, this is the first time I've actually even, I mean, I don't think I've ever used a double exponential as a prior and, uh, and doing Bayesian stuff. So, yeah, I, was, I meant to look into that a little more and see if that's like, there's some reason. You, I mean, normally you'd use something like a Gaussian, use like, because, you know, the uh, central limit theorem, right? That's your best, when all fails, use a Gaussian because you're probably right. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you know, a log, uh, uh, Gaussian, right? Uh, log normal distribution, just because it's multiple, you know, multiplying instead of adding factors or whatever, but just the, you know, central limit theorem in log space, right? So uh, those are so common, right? So a double exponential, I've never, I've never used that before, but maybe I just haven't read the right stuff yet. Yeah, was there anything else, any, anyone else, any intuition, anything to say about the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just one, this section, this section of the book, just, it turns out that rigid regression and lasso follow from these two natural, two special cases of this prior. Yeah, that'll, that'll make, that makes sense to everybody, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me because like, like you were saying, like, uh, there, like you often, like, Builds entirely than you would when you choose lasso or ridge regression in like a frequency type of context. Like, like the decision to choose lasso or ridge over OLS is feels like a very different process than choosing like one prior over another in like a Bayesian regression. You yeah, know? I yeah I agree with you there. I but like somehow you get to this a similar model like that has yeah. this active regularization. Like, I don't know, like, I guess maybe in the Bayesian world, you're just like always thinking somewhat in terms of regularization in some way, like, like depending on your, your prior, like the, I don't know, you need, you know, different strengths of evidence to move, to move the right distribution. Like if you have a, a stronger prior, it's like more regular, regularized in a sense. Because right? yeah. like you're, like it's it it takes more to 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 shift it. Uh, like um, it takes more evidence or stronger evidence. No, that is that is the case. But again, I guess I agree with you that normally you wouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm going to use a double exponential because I hope that I can eliminate some variables. Like no, I, that wouldn't be the thought process, right? But maybe it should be, I don't know, but that's, yeah. 
anyway, that's about all I was going to cover today. And then I guess, like I said, it's two o'clock. So next time we'll cover dimensional rate reduction and some of the things in higher dimensions. And then hopefully maybe do some of the lab or at least talk about it. Or so hopefully if people uh, would try to do at least some of the exercises before next time, then we, if you had that way, if you had some questions about exercises at the end of the session, next time we could talk about it. Does that work for everybody? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, that sounds good. Yes. Oh, oh thank you. I didn't realize you joined us. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for taking this week, Ron. It was, I thought it was a really good discussion. But, uh, it's an interesting chapter. Yeah. For sure. Let me make sure I'm on the thing for next week. Um, okay. When you say exercises, yeah. do you mean the lab and the applied or? or the applied specifically? Um, uh, I, yeah, I was thinking about anything, any lab and apply whatever you guys get around to doing. It'd be good to have, you know, just, I don't think we're gonna have time. To, I don't think we want to push it back another week, right? So, although we could always do, we always could discuss, we don't normally, but we should and could talk about these things on Slack, right? Sure. For yeah. the labs, you mean exercises? Yeah. Exercises, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it makes sense to, to uh, do the exercises next week and um, yeah, just bring, I liked what um, we had talked about last week, you know, yeah. for bringing in, you know, whichever ones you were, <clears throat> were interested in and you have questions about, bring those questions and we can discuss. Yeah, so. That's, yeah, that was the idea I was trying to go for there. Cause I know that yeah. I should be able to cover within hopefully 30 minutes, the 6.3 and 6.4 mm -hmm. only cause I don't have that much to, to say about them. To tell you the truth. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, and then I'll do, I'm doing the week chapter after that. So I'll do yeah, seven um, the week following that. Yeah. Weeks from now. Sounds good. Anyway, thanks all. Appreciate it and uh, appreciate the discussion. See you next time. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.